Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to my channel. So first of all, yes, I can move as you can all probably see. I feel like most of you should be pretty used to it at this point because I do move so often, but I am staying in this apartment for a little while longer, so hopefully we have some better continuity with the background and setup of these videos. Anyways, besides the point, the case that I have for you guys today is one that I'm absolutely so shocked at the lack of coverage. There's almost no articles or information out there on this case besides podcasts and the family just going out to advocate for Jennifer and Adriana themselves. So I wanted to make sure that I covered this case as soon as I could, spread their information and their stories as far as I can. This case just needs eyes on it and it needs somebody to see their faces and remember something and come forward with what they know. Jennifer's mother herself came out and said that people who know information on this case could be anywhere in the country, not just Tennessee where this takes place. So I wanna make sure that I can get this video and get this this case out to as many people as I can all across the country. This case needs to be solved. It's been way too long without answers. It's been 13 years and that is just way too long for a family to suffer without knowing what happened to Jennifer and Adriana. They deserve to be found just as much as anybody else. But before we get into the case, I wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Aura Frames. This holiday season, one of the best things that you can get your loved ones is an opportunity to see you and connect with you. This pandemic has made it so, so difficult, if not impossible, to get together with those who you love most even around the holidays. Whether you live in a different state from the rest of your family like I do, or even if you just have a really busy schedule that keeps you from seeing those you love the most, as I also do, Aura Smart Frames are a great way to stay connected by sharing photos and now videos from anywhere in the world using the Aura app. Aura Frames allows you to share photos and videos with unlimited storage so you can upload over 10,000 photos and videos and invite as many people as you would like to a single frame. It's actually really easy and fun to set up. You download the app and then preload the photos and then you can invite the friends and families that you want to contribute ahead of time. And then once you give the frame to whoever you're giving it to, once they set it up, they'll immediately see the photos that you shared to the frame. But Aura Frames makes your photos private and secure by making it easy to control who has access to the frame and the photos. Aura Frames offer crystal clear resolution that makes photos not even look like they're on a screen, which is really cool. You can also save time with Aura Smart Curation Tool that helps you find your best photos, filtering out duplicates and blurry shots. Aura Frame also has this really cool touch bar on the very top, which allows you to access different settings, swipe between pictures, and do all sorts of fun things like that. Aura Frames also has auto dimming, so your digital photos are displayed in true color while adjusting for brightness for whatever room that they're in. And when you turn off the lights, Aura Frames automatically turns off to save energy. It's such a cool gift for the holidays and it comes ready to give. Each frame comes in a beautifully wrapped box, so there is no wrapping required on your end. I honestly love my Aura Frames. You you guys know how much I'm moving around and I live in a different state from my family and my friends are also always moving around. Everyone in my life is just out doing their own different thing, everyone has their busy schedules, so it's really nice to see a bunch of photos constantly reminding me of all the fun times that we have together and making me feel like we're still close. Also really nice when I do have people over to have pictures filtering through the night so everyone can see themselves in the pictures and it's just a really cool way to start a conversation and look back on memories that we've had together. It really is such a cool gift, whether it be for your significant other or your mom or your dad or your sibling or one of your close friends that lives in a different state. I'm giving one to my boyfriend for Christmas because he mentioned that he wanted to put a picture of us on his work desk and I thought, I can do one better, so I'm giving him a frame where he can put as many pictures as he wants into it. So just a nice gift idea for someone that you love. So many people love this as a gift idea that last year they completely sold out. So you don't want to wait. Make sure you go ahead to AuraFrames.com and use code RACHELSHANNON for up to $30 off while supplies last. That's A-U-R-A frames.com and using code RACHELSHANNON for up to $30 off. I'm so excited about this deal and hopefully Hopefully I gave some of you guys some gift ideas, especially people who don't necessarily always know what to get 
I think this is a great idea. Thank you again so much to Aura Frames for sponsoring today's video. So with all of that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the disappearances of Jennifer and Adriana Wicks. Jennifer K. Wicks was born on August 16th, 1982, and at the time that she went missing, she was 21 years old and had a two-year-old daughter named Adriana Wicks, who was born January 14th, 2002. Unfortunately, I couldn't find much about Jennifer or Adriana in terms of their personalities, what they liked, disliked, and things like that. I really wish that I was able to take the time to get to know the two of them, but what we do know is that Jennifer absolutely loved her baby and wanted to give her the world. She was a victim of her circumstances, and there are a lot of things that we will discuss that made this very difficult for her. At the time of their disappearances, Jennifer had been living with her then boyfriend, Joey Benton, in a home with him and his parents in Robertson County, Tennessee. They had been dating since July of 2003, so at the time of the disappearances, they had been dating less than a year. Joey is not Adriana's father, and I don't know if it's ever been stated who is her father. Now, by all accounts, Adriana and Joey had a very rocky relationship. They had been pretty on again, off again, and they had been fighting quite a bit. So after only about a month or two of living at the Benton family home, she moved out and back in with her grandmother's house because she simply didn't have money to live on her own at the time and she didn't have a job. She didn't really have anywhere else to go. However, she did ultimately return back to the Benton home to live with his family. Again, she didn't have much to her name at the time. She didn't even have a cell phone. She didn't have a car. She was a single mother who was struggling just to get her and her daughter by. Now, according to Jennifer's mother, Kathy, Joey was not a great person and he was definitely not someone that she wanted Adriana to be around. Joey had problems with drugs. He had a history of violence. He had guns in the home, and he had pointed them at both Adriana and Jennifer in the past. But again, it seems like there were things that made it really hard for Jennifer to leave, one of which being that she didn't want to feel like a burden to her family. She didn't want to have to live with them and rely on them. She really did just try to make the best out of a bad situation. On Wednesday, March 24th, 2004, Jennifer had called her mom, Kathy, on Joey's phone, and she was very, very upset in this phone call. She told her mom that she had just gotten into a really bad fight with Joey's mom, Cindy. Apparently, Cindy was upset with Adriana crying all the time, so this really big fight was about that. Jennifer had locked herself in her room for this phone call, and Adriana could be heard in the background of this phone call, still crying. So, Jennifer went over to Adriana to soothe her, and Adriana fell asleep on her at all during this phone call. Her mom offered that night to come and get her and Adriana, but she told her mom that she could handle the situation. She also called her father, Michael Wicks, the next day on March 25th at around 11 a.m. She also told him that she had been fighting a lot with Joey's family and told him that she was looking forward to seeing him that upcoming Sunday where he lived in Manchester. She had also called her aunt Lisa that day to discuss similar things, and in this phone call, she mentioned that she was scared. Lisa also said that she could help. She offered to leave out a key if she needed to come and stay with her, but as she pretty much told everybody else, she told her that she was going to work things out and she was going to figure out the situation. She told her that her and Joey were going to be going on a picnic soon so that they could talk things out. After these phone calls though, no one had seen or heard from Jennifer or Adriana again. So by the evening of Friday, March 26th, Kathy was growing increasingly worried that she hadn't heard from Jennifer, especially knowing that they had just gotten into this huge fight. So she reached out to Joey to ask him where Jennifer was. Joey initially told Kathy that she had just left the house with someone and that he hadn't seen her since. However, he then changed this story later and explained that something else had happened. He told Kathy that on the evening of Thursday, March 25th, the two had gotten into another argument, so a second argument after the one that Kathy knew about that previous Wednesday. He said that after this argument, Jennifer asked him if he could take her and Adriana to the grocery store, but the grocery store that they initially went to was closed, so they ended up going to an Exxon gas station in Cross Plains, Tennessee. He said that Jennifer and Adriana got out of the car and Jennifer asked for him to leave. So he said that he let them go and then drove across the street and sort of waited 
waited there to see where she was gonna go. He said he had been waiting for about five to 10 minutes before he saw a white four-door 90s model Mustang pull up and then the two of them got inside. He said that he did not know the person who was driving the car and he didn't really see them. He then said that the next day, March 26th, so the day that him and Kathy were talking, Jennifer drove back to his house without Adriana and he saw the white Mustang that she had gotten into the day before. And when she came over, she was asking for her tax return money. Jennifer didn't have her own bank account, so her tax return was deposited into Joey's parents' account. However, his parents weren't home at the time, so Jennifer left the home without the money, telling him that she would be back later to pick it up. However, after this, Joey said that she didn't return and that he didn't see her again. Now, Kathy knew that it was possible that Jennifer may go a day or two without contacting her, so she wasn't initially thinking the worst. She didn't jump straight to her being missing or killed or anything bad happening to her. But just based on what I heard Kathy say in interviews, it seemed to me like she just had this motherly instinct where she just felt that something might be off. So she went ahead and called Jennifer's grandmother. Jennifer was incredibly close with her grandmother. Kathy said that if Jennifer spoke with her, that she definitely would have spoken to her grandmother as well. If Kathy hadn't heard from her in a few days, she was confident that she would have called her grandmother at some point in those days as well. But when Kathy spoke to the grandmother and heard that she hadn't spoken to her either, they both knew that something was terribly wrong. So when she still hadn't heard from Jennifer that next day, Saturday, March 27th, Kathy went ahead and reported her and Adriana missing. But for the initial stages of the investigation and the years following, and honestly, pretty much for the entirety of this case, police did not take her case seriously at all. The day that she was reported missing, all they really did was go and knock on Joey's door for a welfare check to see if she was there. And obviously she wasn't, so I think they might've looked around a little bit, but other than that, they didn't seem too interested in actually trying to figure out where she was. Now, it was reported and stated by police that four total searches were done for Adriana and Jennifer. However, any searches that were done were not done using any search warrants, even in the home. They had no search warrants for the home. Rather, they searched the Benton family home with permission that they got from the Benton family while they watched them and monitored them to see what they were looking for. So really, they didn't do any extensive searches. So when they say that they didn't really find anything, it's probably because the Benton family didn't let them look anywhere that they didn't want them to. That's just my opinion, but I feel like it's really dumb, honestly, to go into someone's house and say, hey, we're only gonna search in the places that you approve. Of course, they're not gonna let you search anywhere that they don't want you to find things in. But anyways, they did see that Jennifer and Adriana's belongings were all still in the home with the exception of Adriana's diaper bag. Other than this, they did do one search of the surrounding property with cadaver dogs, but even then, Kathy said that they were allowing the Benton family to play with the cadaver dogs and not even letting them properly do their job. She said that she witnessed people petting the cadaver dogs and that it was obvious that they were not taking these searches seriously at all. When I heard Kathy say that they were allowing this to happen, I was just appalled because obviously most people know that that should not be allowed and it's normally not allowed. There have been a lot of inconsistencies and honestly just lies that the family found out about what Joey said about the last time that Jennifer was seen. So going back to the day that Joey had said he last saw her, Joey said that he saw her get into a four-door white Mustang. This is very strange because there's actually no such thing as a four-door Mustang from the 90s. The weird thing is though, is that Joey would be very well aware of this. He loved Mustangs and even had two himself. He knew everything there was to know about Mustangs. So this doesn't seem like a detail that he would get wrong by accident. So the local newspaper ended up posting about this story and included the report of the four-door Mustang. Well, the day after this was posted, Joey and his father went to the newspaper to tell them that they never said anything about a four-door Mustang because they knew 
that they didn't exist. They claimed that they never said this whatsoever and that the reason the police said this is because they are being entrapped by police. So Joey went off to the sheriff and told him this information and said that he never said anything about the four-door Mustang. So the sheriff actually went ahead and corrected the original report, or I should say corrected the original report and said that Joey really did report a two-door Mustang. Then the sheriff fired the original officer who took the report. Kathy says that she went to the hearing for this police officer and testified against the sheriff because she knew that Joey said it was a four-door Mustang. But the sheriff sided with Joey and did nothing else. Everybody just kept saying and believing that Jennifer and Adriana were runaways and they sided with Joey and they really didn't question anything that he said. So it's really confusing on why Joey would report this detail wrong on purpose. To me, it almost sounds like he just wanted to set something up to make it look like police were after him for no good reason. Either that or he just wanted to steer it away as far as possible from the real car that she got into last. I honestly don't really know, but the fact that the sheriff just sided with Joey on all of this is really confusing and honestly infuriating. Now, when police did speak with Joey about all of this and interviewed him, Joey did tell him that they broke up, but he told police that Jennifer was actually upset with her mom, Kathy, and not him. He told police that Kathy had threatened Jennifer that she was going to take Adriana away, so Jennifer was really upset with her, so she decided to run away and take Adriana with her. So to me, again, just setting up the story that, yeah, we broke up, yeah, we fought a lot, but she wasn't actually mad at me, she was mad at somebody else, so don't look at me, look at Kathy. But Kathy said that this is absolutely preposterous. Kathy said that she did have a serious conversation with Jennifer about the situation that Adriana was living in and the things that she was being exposed to. More of which we will get into in just a minute and it is a serious conversation that honestly I think Kathy needed to have with Jennifer. But Kathy said that she would absolutely never threaten to take Adriana away and I honestly believe her on that. Again, Jennifer tried her best to be a good mother and I don't wanna hear any negative comments about any of this by the way because as it happens so often in women and mothers included, they just get into these awful, awful relationships. They don't have anything to their name and they end up depending on the wrong person. This person is usually making all of these promises to them and supporting them, giving them money, giving them shelter, giving them what they need, but behind closed doors, they're abusing them and they're controlling them and they're making it near impossible to leave. We've talked about this in so many other cases where it's common that an abuser will make someone feel like they have no other options. Even if family is giving them options like, hey, you can come stay with me. I'm not saying that Joey did this or that I know the relationship whatsoever, but it could be possible that he's saying, don't burden them with you. They don't really want you there. They don't really want you living with them. You're just a burden to them. You're just costing them extra money. I can definitely see that being a conversation because that really, to me, is the only reason why Jennifer would just constantly deny this help that other people were trying so hard to give her. So now let's talk about something else in this case that is very, very hard to hear. It's something that made me really upset to hear and honestly sick to my stomach. So if you're sensitive to issues involving child abuse, then I would skip ahead in this video a minute or two because this next part is really hard to hear. It's important to talk about because Obviously, it relates to this case and it can give us further insight into why everything happened the way it did, but I understand that these topics can be very triggering for some people. So going back to the Monday before Jennifer and Adriana went missing, Jennifer took Adriana to the hospital because she was getting really, really sick. Adriana, a baby, was having a lot of difficulty urinating and every single time she tried, she would just cry and cry and scream in pain. After doing further testing, it came back that Adriana had a urinary tract infection, which is something that is more common in sexually active adult females. If a child has UTI, it could be a sign of sexual abuse. Now, there is a chance that this isn't because of sexual abuse. There are other causes of UTIs in children. So I don't want anyone to say that, yes, it definitely points to that. I don't want anyone to say that I'm making accusations or stating anything wrongly, it can point to sexual abuse and there can be other reason, but 
it's really common with sexual abuse. But Jennifer was clearly so very concerned that at least something else was going on in the home. So that's what makes me lean more towards it being possible that it could have been caused by sexual abuse. It makes sense that in the days right after this happened, right after they found out about the UTI, that suddenly she was fighting nonstop with Joey's family and then suddenly both of them go missing. That seems like a pretty big coincidence. Another thing to point out about this, which I heard mentioned in a podcast and it's a really good point, is that if Jennifer was killed because of problems going on in the home, why kill Adriana too? It would be easy to say that Jennifer just left her life and left everything in her life behind, including Adriana. But unfortunately, if Adriana was being abused, it would make sense if they would want her out of the picture too. Because if Jennifer went missing and they decided to actually investigate the case and there were signs of abuse on Adriana, then police would find evidence of that. But as I've been saying through this entire video, nobody takes any part of this case seriously at all. Not the police, not people around town, and people online as well as people around the family have just been all talking so negatively about Jennifer. Thinking back to police taking Joey's side when it comes to this whole four-door Mustang thing, it seemed like them the Benton family, obviously. It seemed like them and everybody else were just trying to shut down any talk about Jennifer and Adriana's disappearances. Kathy tried setting up her own community searches, but most people in town were not very receptive to this. And if this isn't bad enough, she tried hanging missing persons flyers at a gas station, but these were taken down because it was against policy to hang things at the gas station. Again, the assumption the entire time was that Jennifer just ran away and took Adriana with her. But then when Joey returned all of Adriana and Jennifer's belongings, he brought them back to Kathy in six black trash bags. In one of those bags, they found Adriana's pink winter coat. This spoke volumes to Kathy and said that Jennifer did not have plans to leave. She would have needed that winter coat, and if she planned on staying gone, she definitely would have taken it. Plus, you think about the fact that she never got her tax return money. She didn't have anything to her name. She had no money. She had no resources. So if she were going to leave, she would have waited until she had that money. So nothing happened in this case for literally a decade. No matter how hard Jennifer's family pushed, nothing serious was done to find them. Nobody even cared. It wasn't until 2013 that Robertson County Sheriff's Department finally reclassified their missing persons cases as a murder investigation. They said that they have new information that has led them to doing this, but they have not stated what this information was. They asked the public for any information and said that nobody, including Joey Benton, has been ruled out as a potential suspect. Police said that someone out there knows something. Police and Kathy took the stand to say that they just need somebody to come forward. Kathy said that there is reward money, but beyond that, she hopes that someone's conscience will get to them and make them finally come forward. All she wants to do at this point is to lay her girls to rest where they belong. Now, one of the people who Kathy believes knows more than what he's saying is her nephew. Now, like I mentioned earlier, Jennifer spoke to her Aunt Lisa in the day before she went missing. Lisa's son is actually pretty good friends with Joey, so Lisa's son is the same person as Kathy's nephew. Kathy described Joey and her nephew as being, quote, joined at the hip, and they even rode to work together. Kathy says that ever since Jennifer and Adriana's cases have been reclassified to murder investigations, her and Lisa have not spoken at all. And her nephew has not cooperated with police whatsoever. She said that once police try to re-interview people that were involved in the case, which is standard practice, Lisa was so, so upset and angry that her nephew, or Lisa's son, was one of those people that were interviewed. But other than that, even Kathy really does not know what the evidence was that made them reclassify the cases. They did hire a private investigator who's been able to get some new leads and take in new tips. Apparently, this PI also tried talking to Joey, and Joey responded in a very aggressive and defensive way. Another tip that this PI received included a rumor 
that both Adriana and Jennifer are in a well. So Kathy and the PI set up a search in the well and around the area, but I don't think anything came of that search. But now, 13 years after Jennifer and her baby went missing, nothing has ever been done. Kathy said that if there's one thing that she can change about how police stations work, it's that they treat every single case as an actual missing persons case. It's absolutely ridiculous that they didn't even try to search for Jennifer and her baby because they simply just assumed that she ran away. She's at the point where now she even feels like she has to tell people, you know, if I go missing, it's not because I wanted to, it's because something happened or I had a mental breakdown. Please search for me if I go missing because I'm somewhere out there and I want to be found. But no matter how much Kathy advocates for her daughter and her granddaughter, people will continue to say that Jennifer was 21 and she just wanted to go out and live her life and not have anybody know what she was doing. But Kathy knows that this is not the case whatsoever. She's also very frustrated that people are just sitting there online and just bashing Jennifer. So many people have said so many bad things about her and Kathy is concerned that if Jennifer is still out there that she's seeing all of these awful and negative things being said about her, which is such an awful thing to even have to worry about. So that's pretty much where the case lies. I know there really isn't much to go off of, but still, with the information that we have, we can think of two main theories. One theory, of course, is that Jennifer ran away and took Adriana with her. I personally don't think this is true just based on what we've already talked about, but I do want to be fair and there are some things where I can see how and why this would happen. She was in a really bad situation at home and things were only getting worse. If she suspected that Adriana was being sexually abused by someone in the home, then she may have ran and not wanted anybody to know where she went, simply as a means to protect her daughter from everybody. Or maybe she got into this argument and she confronted the family about sexual abuse or something else and they threatened her. We really have no idea what these arguments were about or what was said or how heated they really got. It could have been any number of things, but it is possible that if she brought this up, they threatened her and she decided that she needed to leave as soon as she possibly could. Maybe Jennifer asking for her tax return money was indication that she was considering leaving. Maybe when she came back and asked for this money, Joey had a feeling that she was trying to run and then threatened her, and that's why she didn't come back for the money. If she truly believed that her and her daughter's life were in immediate danger, that would make sense why she wouldn't even take the chance to return back to the home to get her money. Maybe she somehow got into contact with somebody who picked her up and helped her run. We know that she didn't have any money, and as far as we know, her family seems like they didn't help her run. We know that she didn't have a cell phone to contact anybody and she didn't have a job. So to me, I just don't see how she could have gone out and met someone who was willing to help her run I don't know how she would have set it up or contacted anybody to do this either. I don't really know, but it is possible. I mean, we know that she locked herself into a room to talk to Kathy, so maybe as she was doing that, after that phone call, she contacted someone else and deleted the call, and Joey just didn't think to look. Or maybe he did see the call and that's why he threatened her. I don't really know. This can go any number of ways. It could also be possible that she was able to get into contact with a domestic abuse shelter and they helped her run and hide her identity. These are all things that I do consider in relation to this theory, but the biggest thing pointing away from this all is the fact that she never got back into contact with her mother. I feel like at some point she would have wanted her mom to know that she was still out there and that she was safe. I can see that if she really did get into contact with somebody, whether it was a domestic abuse shelter or someone else, that they would advise her not to contact her mom at first, but it's been 13 years. You would think at some point she would feel okay to send out a letter, send out some sort of message to her mother, letting her know that she was okay. I think that it's safe to say that if Jennifer asked her mother not to tell anybody where she was, including police, that she would respect this and that she wouldn't tell anybody. But I don't think her mom would continue going onto podcasts and continue talking about this and keep posting on the Facebook page that they have and keep putting so much effort into finding her if Jennifer ever reached out to her and said, hey, I'm safe, don't tell anyone, but you know, I just wanted you to know. Her family's behaviors and all of this and everything leading up to it is why I believe that when she did not choose to go missing and if 
somehow she did, that she didn't contact her family. The other theory, of course, is that Joey or his family is in some way responsible for the disappearances. As we stated before multiple times throughout this video, there are questions as to whether or not Adriana was being sexually abused by somebody in the home. Then we also know that Joey had a history of being violent and having guns and drugs in the home. It's possible that she confronted everybody about the sexual abuse or maybe about something completely different, but it's possible that she confronted them, things got heated, out of control, and Jennifer was killed in the moment. And maybe they didn't necessarily want to hurt Adriana, or maybe they did. But again, if she was being abused by someone in the home and somebody came out looking for Jennifer, police started looking into it, they might want to check into things and see if there was any abuse going on, and they might see signs of that on Adriana, which would kind of put everything together and would point directly to Joey or his family. I do also want to point out that Joey's family lives on a pretty big plot of land with about an acre of property. It has a pretty densely wooded area, but even beyond their property, there's more land and more wooded areas around it. This is a picture from the family's Facebook page showing what their property looks like. It's thought that if she was killed, if they both were killed, that they might be somewhere out there on that property and they haven't been found because nobody's bothered to search it well enough. Then the other thing in relation to this that kind of sets off a lot of red flags in my head is the fact that Kathy said that when they did bring cadaver dogs on the property, the Benton family was seeing it playing with them. Maybe they weren't really playing with them for fun, but to try and get them off of their trail. The other theory within this theory is that maybe something happened to Jennifer and then to go along with this whole idea of her running off and taking Adriana, Joey sold or gave up Adriana in some sort of black market adoption or human trafficking. Adriana was only two years old when this all happened, so if she was adopted by another family, she wouldn't even remember her mother or remember any of this happening. I definitely and truly believe that the hospital visits and these worsening fights definitely have something to do with Jennifer and Adriana's disappearances. Whether Jennifer felt the need to run or if Joey hurt the both of them. I think that these fights and this entire thing with the family and the hospital visits, I think these are all far too big of a coincidence to ignore. If Jennifer did have the means to run, I almost feel like I would lean towards that. I could definitely see why she would want to run and stay missing. But the fact that she didn't have any means, she really didn't have anybody, all of that together, and the fact that she never reached out to family to let them know that she was safe ever, even 10 years later, that is very concerning. I feel like if they did run off and she still had Adriana, I think that Adriana's 18th birthday may be a big landmark or a big milestone to reach out to her family. You know, she's an adult now, there's nothing that anybody could do to take her away because she's an adult. So just thinking about that, I, I don't know. That's, those are all just things to me that I'm thinking about throughout all of this that make me think that she's not out there and that she's not just hiding from Joey and his family. The fact that Joey changed his story and this whole Mustang thing happening and his behaviors after the disappearances really just make him look not very good. I have no idea why police are so against investigating. I don't know if the Benton family is close with police. I don't know if there's illegal stuff or corruption going on in the police. I don't know if the police are just simply lazy, but whatever it is, it's heartbreaking and it's infuriating. I feel like the only reason that media has not reported on this case very much is because of the situation that Adriana and her mother were in. I feel like if this were a case of a mother and a daughter who were in a more affluent family, who had money, who lived in you know a nicer area of the country, I feel like it would have been reported on a lot more. Neither Joey nor his family has shown absolutely any interest in helping search for them or locate them. They simply don't care. So the fact that they genuinely don't care, they don't want to find them, don't even care what happened to them, that really makes me think that they're responsible because they don't care, they don't want to search, it's because they know where she is. They know where the both of them are. If there's anything that you take from this case, I just want it to be that no matter your situation, no matter who you are, no matter what you look like, no matter where you live, 
You deserve to be searched for just as much as anybody else. Please share Jennifer and Adriana's story either by sharing this video or pictures of them or any of the articles that I've linked below. There needs to be more eyes on this case and more people caring about these two missing persons. Jennifer and Adriana Wicks went missing on March 25th, 2004 from Robertson County, Tennessee. Jennifer was 21 years old at the time and would be 39 now. She was described as a white female standing at 5 feet 4 inches tall, weighing 130 pounds. She has brown hair and brown eyes and wears glasses with an oval-shaped wire frames. She has two ear piercings and a tongue piercing. Adriana was 2 years old when she went missing and would be 19 years old now. She is a white female with brown hair and blue-green eyes. She has a birthmark on the front of her right upper thigh. There's a $25,000 reward for information leading to finding Jennifer and Adriana. You can leave an anonymous tip by calling 513-426-9553. All of this information will be linked down below as always. So that is all I have for today's case. And now I want to hear your guys' thoughts. What do you think happened to Jennifer and her baby? Do you think that she chose to go missing to escape the abuse? Or do you think that Joey or his family has something to do with their disappearances? Please, let's discuss in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss any of my future videos. Don't forget to go ahead and follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both will also be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to send those suggestions over to rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have a great week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time.